make us worthy, O Lord, to say thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to reverse from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, thy is the kingdom, power, and glory now and forever. Amen. Last time we saw the blessing of Jacob to the sons of Joseph, and we saw that uh, it's almost like a little liturgy. When Jacob brings up the promises of God, and then after that, he blesses the children of Joseph. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Dane. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and God, Amen. And Jacob called his son and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn my might in the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Before you go, let, yes. me, let me ask about this. Anyone knows what he's talking about? Why? First of all, he says, you are the product of good times, times of health and power. When, when Jacob was very strong and uh, times of youth and, and li when life was good. That's what he's trying to say, the excellence and the power. But then, although he is the product of all these good times, he did something very shameful. Everybody knows what he did. <clears throat> uh, did he, was he the one that Slept with his father's something. Yeah, he slept with his, his father's concubine. concubine. That uh, half wife, half slave. It was Bila, the the slave or the maid, the maid of uh, Rachel. Reuben did this. A very very uh, shameful thing he did. Um, and. Um, you just have to understand that why why is why is Robin doing this? I mean, he's the son of Jacob. Jacob is a holy person. He would not do anything like that. <clears throat> How come he is the brother of Joseph, who refused to who refused to come near the woman who was married in Egypt because it was an abomination, something very disgusting and very shameful, and he would not do it and make God angry. Why would his older brother, the firstborn, do it? Think about that. Let's continue. And we, we have to collect those questions and answer them at the end. Go ahead. Um, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Finish each, each, each group. So he's going to give, he, he grouped this two together. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstring, hamstrung an ox, <clears throat> cursed by their anger, and it, and it is fierce in their wrath. For it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Okay, what does he mean by that, about Simeon and Levi? Hmm. So, by the way, uh, what does he mean by not by uh, by uh, Reuben not being exalted? Okay, well, that's a question to ask, and then these questions will have to. Why did Reuben did what he did? And although he is the son of Jacob, the, the holy man, and Joseph is his brother, a pure, humble, uh, uh, chaste person, while Simeon and Levi, what's wrong with them? And why they are put together? <clears throat> that's number two and three. <clears throat> Were they the ones that um, went and killed the people who, whose like son raped their sister? Exactly, they were the ones to kill the family and the town of Shechem. Was the name of the city and the name of the, the, the son, the man who raped Dina. They went and killed them. They tricked them though. They didn't kill them in a war. They did a trick. Remember what did they do? The, and the man said, I want to marry the daughter. So what did they say? They said, you have to circumcise yourself, but then they all became weak. 
Mm -hmm. In the third day, they became very weak and febrile, and they were ill. So they went and took advantage of the weakness and killed all of them. That's why Jacob here is kind of uh, disowning them, in a way. He said, I don't want to be with them. They're cruel, and their counsel is a counsel of uh, destruction. Why did we not say this before? I'm th well, I think he did. He did, yeah. Yeah, he did. He was very upset, and he told but me. But this is so sad, because this is right before he dies. Yes. He's like not having compassion on his own sons. No, no. He said that's uh, something he cannot really approve of or bless. Uh, you have to understand now, this is important. This is not something that he can twist his heart's arm to do. A blessing has to come from the heart. And if the heart is not satisfied, contrast this, and I hope this is still with you, with the way uh, Isaac wanted to bless Jacob, uh, to bless Esau. What did he ask of Esau? To make his favorite food. Again, and we said the reason why is it's because he wants his heart to be pleased when he is satisfied with what his son is doing as usual. He's excited about it. His heart is open. It has to be through a meal. Here, there's nothing that's going to make him uh, have peace toward these two children of his. Nothing they can do. And he cannot force it and he cannot pretend. We learn, we learn a lot of pretense and, and to act like we are trying to be nice and politically correct. <laughs> Jacob is not going to be politically correct. He's going to say what is in his heart because that's what God will see. But it doesn't mean that he's cursing them. There's no curse. The, the whole point is they will be the, the, the dispersed in Jacob, meaning you know, what happens to the Levi, especially the Levitical line. When they go into the land with Joshua, what happens? <clears throat> they will not have a city. They will not have a, 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 a land. They will be given different places, different cities, and they will be all over the country. And the reason is they're dispersed because of their violence. But what, how God is going to use this? He will send the Levites, the Levites to every tribe. They will be priests and deacons, and their job will be to teach the people and pray with them. So he used their evil doing and their uh, the consequence to serve Israel. And later on, it's going to happen with Israel. So he said, "I want you to be a blessing to the all to all the nations." If they were obedient and good, God would call, call them to be missionaries. But what if they are disobedient and evil? Will God promise to Abraham will be annulled because of the disobedience of his children? <clears throat> By your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through the disobedience of Israel, God dispersed them in the whole world and became a blessing to the whole world against their will. So what you see here is this double fold vision of it. From one side, it's a punishment. I'm going to disperse you in Israel. From another side, God used that punishment to bless Israel. They needed the Levites. Who will teach them in every town about God and who will pray for them and who will spend time reciting the Torah of Moses and then will be the one to teach it to, to the people. If you leave the Levites to themselves, they will clump themselves in a family, in a city or another city or in a place. But God used the punishment to have them as a tool, as priests. So they will be in every place. When Israel fails, of course. Does that make sense? Is that clear? No? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So I that's... still don't get, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I don't get why he chose Levi to be the tribe of the priests. You don't he... know, do you know why or you don't know why? But 
Is it, it's like coming in the Bible or we should already know that? It is. Absolutely. It is coming in the, in the, in the book of Numbers. Okay, we'll get to that then. <laughs> yeah. In the book of Numbers, it will be very clear why, why God had chosen the Levites. The Levites would be the, the, the priests and the deacons, the servants of God. But here you would have it as a punishment, not as a blessing. See, I would disperse them. Um, I will disperse them and scatter them, divide them and scatter them in Israel. It seems like a punishment for their violence. That uh, he's saying, I don't want them to be together again. When they got together, they got the worst plan, and they were very violent. And, and uh, they deceived people in a time of peace and killed them. It's awful. So you have Reuben uh, committing sexual problems, sexual sins, and you have Levi and Simeon causing violence and bloodshed, innocent bloodshed. I mean, not very innocent, but at least it was not prepared. They, they, they killed him in cold blood, like we say. Okay, next in line, number four. Go ahead. Um, uh, Judah, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From, yeah. from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion and as a lion who, who shall rouse him. A scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. All right. Uh, do you see here any rebuke or uh, discipline or a problem? Okay. Uh, let me ask no. this. No, there's nothing. There's nothing really. There is no rebuke in this one. He had not done anything to hurt his father. And in fact, when you go back to the story of uh, selling, selling Joseph, he was not a person to agree with them. But is Judah completely clear? No. No. We just had read an incident how he thought of his daughter-in-law as a prostitute and he wanted to have her services and then ended up having children from her. Uh, although he never touched her again, but that's what he did. But yet, he didn't hurt his father in, in a direct way. Okay, but again, Judah doing this. Why is he Judah doing this? So you have the firstborn, you know, um, insulting his father and disgracing him. You're having the second and the third being violent and getting his, their father in trouble. You have the fourth one, not doing things into, to his father, and father doesn't hold any grudges against him. But as a character in himself, is this this great weakness, and um, as an, an, a person who should be a grandfather, had done something very disgraceful. But yet he's blessed. What's a lion's whelp? Anybody knows what the whelp is? It's another word for a cup. Yeah. Well, go ahead. No, no, I wasn't going to say that at all. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, yeah. Is, a, is a cup, right? Is a small lion. Okay. So he's calling him a small lion. So who is the big lion? He is. <laughs> yeah, Jacob. Is. <laughs> so he's, he's actually naming him. It's very interesting. Indirectly, he's naming him as. So it is not Robin. It is not Simeon. It's not Levi. It is Judah. He is the one to take his place. That's exactly it. So the, the, the firstborn right is moving and is passing from Reuben and it's going to uh, Simeon and it passed Simeon and it passed Levi and it's coming to Judah. Judah will be the firstborn in that situation. So he's saying, uh, you're very strong. You are reminding you reminding me of myself, in a way. Um, uh, you lie down like a lion, and a lion who shall arouse him. Meaning, this tribe 
of Judah will be the prominent tribe. And he's going to say, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. What's scepter? Scepter of royalty. The king. Who is going to fulfill that? Jesus. Or David. Uh, or both. David first, right? <laughs> Because even Jesus is going to come to take the throne of David. So uh, David is called the, the star of Judah. He is the star of Judah. And um, so he's from that line. David is from that line. So he's prophesying. He's saying a prophecy about the royalty of Judah. So there is, a, there is the scepter and law giving. What's the lawgiver? <coughs> A lawgiver is a judge. So the king and the judge are one and the same. Until Shiloh, this is very interesting. Shiloh is a word that means to whom the whole kingdom belongs. What's he saying? He's saying there will be a line of kings coming out of Judah that will never be interrupted until that person to whom it belongs will come. In a way, it's a, it, it's a metaphor, it's a prophecy about the coming of Christ. So the scepter will not depart Judah until to whom it belongs, the kingdom will come. And to him shall be the, the obedience of the people. And he is right. Anahit, he's talking about Christ here, the line of Judah. And uh, in the book of Revelation, you would hear that. Don't be, and then when he was, uh, when John was, uh, was, uh, was crying because the, the, the scroll could not be opened, no one dared to look at it. One of the 24 priests told him, don't cry. Should we go there? Can you go to book of Revelation, chapter five? <clears throat> What is, so Shiloh is Christ? That's um, to whom, Shiloh is translated as to whom it belongs. Okay, to whom it belongs. I thought it was what? a place. It's not a place. It is a place too. Oh, okay. Where the tabernacle would be. Ah, uh, okay. It's the name of a place. But it, in, this, in this verse, it means to whom it belongs. Uh, it's in Hebrew, Shiloh. She, 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 uh, chapter 5. Shiloh. So in chapter 5, uh, it says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming, angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders, the 24 priests, said to me, Do not weep. Behold the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. That's... That's the thing. So who is this lion? And behold, he saw a lamb. Who is the lion that is worthy? We call him worthy to open the scroll. That is Christ. So this is answering to the prophecy of Jacob about his son, the fourth one. And it's important that we stop there and think about him as the lion. And why is the lion strong? He is the king of the wood. He is the king of all beasts. We're going to see from, from Judah and after that, they're going to have lots of other animals. <laughs> He's going to call them by animal, animal uh, figures. Let's go back. So the first three didn't say anything about them. He just actually didn't have any interest to, um, but he gave them, he gave them some kind of, uh, so kind of discipline or punishment. So Reuben, is not exalted means he's not going to be the firstborn it's out of that uh, we're we're yeah 49 but then simeon and he so he talks about them as uh, tools of violence 
Judah comes and he's a lion. Now we go on from there. He's the king now because a lion is a king. Then you can talk about different other things. Um, next verse, 11, 12. Go ahead, Danny. Binding his donkey to the vine, his donkey is called to the choice vine. He washes garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Okay, that's very interesting image, right? Yeah. He's, there's a donkey and there's a vine. And these are all imagery from the New Testament. Jesus is going to speak about that. He calls himself the true vine. And he uses a donkey to enter as a king. Remember that we were talking about the kingdom. As a king to Jerusalem, to the city of the king. And the imagery is going to the grape juice and the wine, which Jesus would use to, uh, to give us as his, his blood. Um, now we go to the next, next one, Zebulun. Uh, Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea and shall become a haven for ships and his borders shall adjoin uh, Sidon. It's a shark, mm -hmm. is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw the, the rest, he saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. All right, that before we go further, Zebulun is not like any animal, but uh, he, he told, he foretold where the tribe will live. They will live by the sea. But Issachar is going to be a, a, a very hard working tribe and they will be okay with that. They were not going to be and they will act like servants or slaves uh, just to get to get to rest that they don't want to be you know looking for wars or fights or anything to just just will be working for our bread and to live in the land because we like this place next then <clears throat> Uh, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a scepter or a serpent, sorry, by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heel so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Let us stop here. Dan means judge. You say Danny, Danny is a judge. But it's, it's not a very good prophecy for Dan. He calls him a serpent and a viper, and then he calls for God's salvation. So um, he uh, is predicting that then the tribe will be causing some major trouble. And then you're going to see this in the book of Judges. The tribe of Dan will cause a lot of trouble as they enter the promised land. Um, some go all the way to say that the Antichrist will come from that tribe because of that sentence, I have waited for your salvation, O God, and that, that he's called a serpent. That's the uh, tribe where the, it's very, you know, it's very far stretched. I don't see anything in the Bible that talks about that. But one more thing, the book of Revelation mentioned all the tribes, except the tribe of Dan in heaven for some reason. So there is, has to be something behind it that Dan is called a serpent and he's not mentioned in heaven. And there had to be something behind that. So people kind of conclude then maybe the Antichrist is coming from, but we don't know where the tribe of Dan is. Nobody knows. All right. The next one. So you got uh, Zebulon as a donkey, Dan as a serpent, Judah as a lion. Okay. That a troop shall tramp upon him and he shall triumph at last. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Uh, Nef Naphtali is a deer that loose. He uses beautiful words. Joseph, is a, yeah. So it's like Naphtali is um, is a, a meek animal, but it doesn't it doesn't like he's wild. He uses is is very attractive, but you cannot catch him or you cannot do anything with him. So that's what he's describing the tribe as. Now we come to Joseph. And Joseph is going to take like half of this prophecy. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Joseph is a fruitful bow. Bach, a fruitful bach as w- by a well. His branches uh, run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made by, were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Uh, from there is the shepherd and the son of Israel. By the God of your father, who will help you, by the Almighty, who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who is separate from his brothers. Let's stop here. So Joseph is not an animal, actually. Joseph is what? Go back and look at it. Fruitful. Bow. Yeah. It's a, a branch, a fruitful branch of a beautiful tree. And it's on the well. Does that sound familiar? That's why I say Joseph is very special. Does this sound familiar? Have you heard that before? Something like this image somewhere? Hmm? Um, flowers on a well? This, that's not flowers, it's actual fruit. Oh, fruit? Blessed is the man that walks not in the way of the ungodly, nor sits in the council of the mocking, uh, but becomes like the, the, the tree that is planted on the, the rivers of water that actually have leaves that does not fall and its roots are plentiful. Who is that? Isn't this psalm about Christ? Yes, it's the first psalm. Can yeah. we get the first psalm? We read this every morning in the first hour. That's why I say Joseph is very special. There's a lot of imagery that comes with Joseph that's only coming with Christ. It's like the only other person that have the same exact image, almost step by step. And um, Okay. Blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly and has not stood in the way of the sinners and has not sat in the seat of the evil men, but his will in the law of the Lord and in his law he shall meditate day and night. That's how the will is, that the water is. He shall be like the tree which is planted by the streams of water, when, which shall yield its fruit in its due season and its leaves shall not scatter. And everything he does, he succeeds, he prospers. Does that sound like Joseph? And the Lord was with Joseph and he was a man of success, a man of prosperity. Everything he touches is blessed. And Jacob saw this and he called it uh, a fruitful tree on a well. The imagery of those old people comes from a deep, deep meditation, contemplation about things. And they get images. When you look at a, especially in a Bedouin culture where you, uh, you know, have to plant and have to work very hard. So you find a place where there's a lot of water and you plant a tree and it comes out and then it's very easily watered. You can find fruit when you come to it because the water is keeping it alive and there's abundance of it. So who else called himself a tree? Go back to the Bible. Let's go to John. The Gospel of John. Chapter 15. The 
does Jesus say there? I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he proves that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean. So he's saying that we, being fixed and rooted in Jesus, we become that branch that brings fruit. Because in him, we have the water of life that feeds our life every single day. So the fruit comes naturally, abundantly, and everybody sees it. Okay, so we have these images from Joseph, Psalms, and John. They all speak about the same thing. Seems more like uh, Jesus is the origin. Joseph is the type. He's like, he's like Christ. He left his life. But it doesn't end up here. Let's go back to Genesis. This, with this image comes the persecution. Doesn't really... It's, it's beautiful, it's nice, it's very rich and pleasing, but it doesn't stop. Let's continue, Joseph, read it, reading this part that uh, then, then he read, read about um, go back one step. So, uh, okay. 22, right? Yeah, yeah, 22. Uh, Joseph is a fruit, a fruitful bow and a fruitful bow uh, by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his that's the thing. So the archers saw it and they hated it. One one thing about this is in the old times when you see a tree with a big branch and there's fruits up there. So the archers they shoot at the fruit to come down. It might look like the, they hate the branch, but the whole point is to bring the harvest, the fruit. And this is actually can be said about Christ when, when they persecuted him, when they wounded him so that we can get healing, when they pierced him so that we can have life and they killed him so that his life will become ours. The same thing with Joseph, the persecution that happened to Joseph in Egypt and the selling of him as a slave was the reason for them to survive the famine and to be kept in the big plan of God until the time comes for them to take over the land. So Joseph was means of survival. Their persecution of him, that's what Joseph is going to say in the next chapter, in chapter 50. You meant it for evil. You meant it to shoot me, but God meant it for good. Because of the fruits that were in, in, in Joseph, every time they hurt him, something good comes out of it. Uh, but the blessing is so beautiful. I, I love this blessing. Every time it comes, I come to read it, it's, it's like moves me. And he says, when he says, his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the, the, the stone of Israel. By the God of your father, who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessing of the breasts and the womb. That's the blessing of the mother. What do you see in this? I, I will just want your, your simple reflection on the words of Jacob to Joseph. So how do you feel like Jacob? How do you describe Jacob's heart? And in, in that brings out all these words, beautiful words. He's like so proud of his son who has followed God and followed his commandments and loved God. Yeah. And he's like so proud because he sees how much God has blessed him yeah. and used him for good. He can't contain himself. He, he's trying to get all the words that is the sweetest words you can say to someone. And he's always bringing God to bless him right and left in all the ways he can think of. And it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. There's like a wealth of blessing coming from the heart of the Father that wants his son to be completely covered with it in every image possible. The next one. Mm 
the blessing of your father, he said, have excelled, excelled the blessing of my ancestors. Like what I have in my heart for you, Joseph, is much more than, than Abraham had done and much more than what my father had done to me. Um, I, I think it's, in, it's like in uh, corresponds to the amount of suffering and work and faithfulness that Joseph had. Uh, don't forget that Jacob, to get the blessing, had to cheat. And he had done very little to his father. For Joseph to get the blessing, he had honored his father to the utmost degree. And he honored God. And Joseph, Jacob feels all that. It's overwhelming. And, and it's coming out from that place in his heart, the deepest place possible. And he goes to you know, go out of it, say, out to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. So what does this mean? So it's a difficult language, but it says, as big as the mountains, as the biggest mountain on earth, this should be the, the blessing that should be covering my son. This shall be on the head of Joseph. And he calls him the crown of the head of him who was separated from his brothers. Separated here means dedicated, consecrated, which translated holy, the holy one. Okay. I want to just stop here and talk about Joseph a little bit. So why did Joseph come up this way and um, why he stood this temptation while you have that his brothers are like very different, very different, including Judah, which is the one that got the, the highest praise in all of the rest. You will see that like Benjamin as actually is going to be a wolf. But why Joseph? I think that J Joseph is one that really tells me about um, his, his identity, his belonging. Because what influenced those kids as they grew up with their father, Jacob, is their culture. They belonged almost completely to the culture they lived in. They came up from Paden Aram and um, uh, idol worshiping culture and they lived among Canaanites, even worse. And they adopted the habits and the ideology and the mind and the lifestyle of the Canaanites. It's very difficult not to do so. Um, when you think about Canaanites, it's a, it's a culture of violence culture of uh, promiscuity and they are led by their passions and you see that penetrating in the family of Jacob uh, you know unfortunately they were not all saints like Jacob and uh, they it, it, it hurted the heart of the man big big time who's a godly man but that's what it is you know his first son did what he did his fourth son had had done that same thing with his daughter-in-law and the two in between have killed people in cold blood. But Joseph is completely different, completely different. He has an identity of his own. Whenever he was in Canaan, he was stuck with his father, serving him obedient, even to death. When he told him to go fetch his brothers and give them food and water, he looked for them until he got lost. When he goes to Egypt, he is holding his own in a, in a strong way that is actually unbelievable, worthy to dedicate chapters, many chapters to the story of Joseph. And uh, to me, that's a very inspiring model. Like he would, that one word that he said that made it, made it very clear. He said, how can I do this and sin against God, this great offense and sin against God. He thinks of himself different. He holds himself in a different light. No matter what culture you put him in, Joseph's going to be the same. He is free. He is very free. Even if we put him in prison, he cannot quench the freedom of Joseph by imprisoning him. Um, if he's in Canaan, he's not like the Canaanites. If he's in Egypt, he's not like the Egyptians. And I think that this was very clear, especially to his father who saw that. And that's why he missed him every time he was different. 
And if you want to, if you want to teach kids in the Sunday school about identity and holding one's identity and not yielding, teach him about Joseph, his, his secret of strength, that he had received faith from his father and he kept it and he had God in his mind all the time. Who that's whom he belonged to. Now, let's continue with Benjamin, unless we have something to say about Joseph again. Okay. Danny? Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Uh -huh. So, the, Benjamin is not even... Um, <laughs> uh, a, a very pleasant imagery. It's like he, he sees in Benjamin as a tribe, a bad thing. And by the way, the, you're going to have in the books of Moses some not very good imagery, and then the judges will do the same about Benjamin. Yeah, Benjamin is a tribe of King Saul. Okay. Next. And by the way, King Saul and, um, and, and Saul of Tarsus is Benjaminite. Seems like Saul is a common name among them. Next. And these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them, and he blessed, he blessed each one according to his own blessing. That and means that he didn't really deprive them of a blessing. He still is their father, but the, the, the prophecies were not that best. You know, that was not good. Okay. Uh, then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Buried, bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the high. The high, high okay, what we asked, why did he ask them to bury him with the rest of them? With the Abraham and Isaac and his mother, Rebecca, and his wife. Uh, his wife, no, it was different, different story. But why he wanted him to be buried with his father and grandfather? And with Sarah, grandmother. I think we talked about this before, actually. And yeah. you said that um, it's because they be believed in like the resurrection and that they were going to uh, rise uh, together. Yeah, rise together. And when he wakes up from his dead, long sleep of death, he wants to see his father and grandfather with him. And where did they get that idea about the resurrection? From... Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac. Exactly. That yeah, I him. just want. Yeah, I want to make sure that this is very clear. And before that, nobody understood anything about the resurrection. Never, never thought of. People who die, they never come back. So where did you get that idea? It was not communicated by God as a teaching in a Sunday school. And God led Abraham in a practical exercise to see the resurrection as the only way out of our death when he asked him to kill Isaac whom he had already promised that he will be the father of many generations for God to be truthful on both cases Isaac has to rise again otherwise he will not have descendants by Isaac so they, the, the idea of now they translated this into a practical thing I now know that we will rise from the dead so what I'm going to do with this bury me with my grandfather and my father because when I rise, I can see it. I have to see them. I have to realize that I'm not alone rising up in a land that I don't know about. To nobody in, in, in there. I don't know anybody there. Okay. Uh, in the cave that is the field of Mech Mechpelah, which is before mem memory, memory, in the land of Canaan, uh, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron, the Hittite, as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There, there they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, that Leah died, you know. Well, that's what happened. Leah died too. So, and everyone except Rachel, because he buried her in Bethlehem. Ephrata, yeah. The cave and the field in the cave uh, that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last. 
and was gathered to his people. That's the term. Gathered to his people, it means he died. So uh, it's very, very uh, classical way to go. And you gather your children, tell them what you need to tell them, and most important things you need them to hear, and then you leave, which is the end of the story of Jacob. And 49, the story of Jacob finishes. We have one more chapter to see how they will do without their father. Now the father is gone. Next time we'll look into that chapter and conclude the book of Genesis. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, questions? I have some questions, Abuna. Sorry, yeah. I know it's late. Maybe. But no, okay. no, go ahead. Um number one, why did the Jews if this was if the resurrection of the dead was such a practical and real thing for the patriarchs, why were the Jews so like, why was that not a practice in their faith to also be as practical and real about it? Uh, they, uh, they had developed this. They didn't really see. It took them a lot of time to develop the idea about what happens after death. And then when later after the Greeks had invaded the area and took over and you have the problem of the Sadducees who so stopped believing in the resurrection and the spirits. And they said, all we have is this life, we have to live it by all means. There's a lot of confusion. There was no, um, there was no uh, developed thought about anything. They didn't develop the thinking process about it. It's theology that had to develop it's exactly what we did in the old in the New Testament when we started developing our theology. We had counsel to discuss different things when we were challenged. It took them a long time to get there. Okay. And God was yeah. not really, and you can see that in the Bible. God is not to uh, set somebody and give them a class, a theology class. No, he it's lets not, them fit. Yeah, they need to figure it out themselves. And this is God's way from the beginning. Some, some things that people will never learn. It's, so once the, God says something, they will go into the models of the Egyptians about the resurrection and that they have to keep food and stuff because they're going to come back to uh, uh, physical life and, and have kids and live again in the same way. They have to eat and drink and go to the bathroom and the whole thing. That's what the ancient Egyptian thought. So these thoughts could kind of infiltrated the culture at the time. So when if God says one thing, they get a little bit drifted into another thing. So they have to develop a thought for it one, one thing at a time, like children teaching them uh, math. You cannot sit them down and teach them calculus. They have, to go, they have to go through the learning the numbers and adding and subtracting and dividing and then go into algebra and pre-algebra and the whole, the whole bag of it. And then I have another... Um question but it's kind of longer so maybe I'll ask next week but it's just about like the like it seems like Jacob had such a vivid vision or a vivid image of what Christ would be like he said his eyes would be like dark wine and his teeth were whiter than milk like and um and the faith of the patriarchs, they they really understood the resurrection, and they I mean they they knew about Christ, <laughs> like they absolutely I to the point where like him. it seems like they saw him. Yes. So yeah. that I guess is my question, which is about like which I know we already talked about, but which is about like Melchizedek mm -hmm. and. How could Melchizedek, and then you said maybe he was Shem, I think, right? That's a very strong, that's a very strong uh, current in the Jewish scholarship, even from okay. all times. The rabbis had almost like confirmed it had to be him. But then, so the mystery of that, which is like a question I'm having now is like, if the order of Melchizedek is a different it's a different order than the order of the Levites, the priesthood yes. of the Levites, because the order of Melchizedek is the, higher. 
it's eternal. And yeah. the order of the Levites is finite yeah. because it was yeah. made of above above men. Mm-hmm. So who <laughs> I know it's a mystery, but like is Mel- like could Melchizedek have been literally have been some sort of like I don't know, like something which was like a pre-Christ. Because he couldn't have been finite if the order of Melchizedek is infinite. And then Mm -hmm. just the faith of the patriarchs in Christ, it seems like they had to have seen something. Like they, It couldn't have just been like, I mean, I know that our faith is not based on things that are seen, but like, it seems like they have seen, they, it seems like they've seen more. They know more than... What's Don't forget there? that Jacob struggled with God. She, he saw Christ and he struggled with him. Yeah, okay, yeah. But then I want to tell you something. So this is the question they're asking. The order of Melchizedek is the order of the firstborn. The order of the Levites is a substitute when the firstborn failed. We're going we're gonna to see this. This is actually when Moses is going to, God is going to tell him to count the firstborn and count the Levites, and the Levites will substitute the firstborn for priests. It was a shameful event. That it's like a disgrace in the history of the Israelites. How uh, at the golden calf, when Moses is going to ask those who belong to God to come to him to avenge, uh, you know, to be zealous for God, and the firstborn don't come. Who comes to him are the, his tribe, the, the Levites. They get very zealous for God and they want to do God's, um, uh, to restore God's glory and God's uh, dignity. So they go and um, Moses tells them, kill everyone who is worshiping the golden calf and getting drunk and committing all kinds of sexual stuff. So they go from one place to another, killing all those who are dancing and drinking and playing. The word playing is a very gentle word. Um, to describe what happened. It was very, very scandalous. And they killed him. They killed like maybe 20, 30,000 that day. And then Moses said that that day, you have confirmed yourself as priest for God. And God says to Moses, till there's us, take, take back your firstborn. I don't want him. And then in the book of Numbers, there are three censuses, three numbers. First one is the, all the males 20 years and above to inherit the land. The last census is the same, major census, 20 years and all to inherit land, second generation. The one in between in chapter three is a smaller census. Count all the firstborn, can count all the Levites, and let's substitute one for one. And if there's more firstborn, they give money to the, to the tabernacle. And the eternal, eternally meant is the firstborn order. That's Jesus. That's the order, that's the eternal order. That Adam should have been for the for the creation. Noah should have been. Shem should have been. Uh, Ishmael should have been. Esau should have been. Some of them were good. Some of them were bad, and they lost it. Okay, so it's it is the order of the firstborn, and Correct. not necessarily like a single they, person. Yeah, and they have to be some sort of infinite being, but it's just like because yeah, because the firstborn is Christ. Okay, yeah, that's him, because that's what Saint Paul is going to come and say: mm-hmm. the firstborn over all creation. Here, his order is the order of priests, the order of uh, the blessing and the holiness and the education of the people and the mediation. That's the, that's what it means to be a firstborn. That is the order. And then Melchizedek becomes likened to him. Mm, okay. It's called the order of Melchizedek because nobody has seen the sun. Nobody knows about the sun anymore. So that's like before, before he came. So who came first? First one to show us that order is Melchizedek. So we refer that order to him. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Abuna. You're welcome to say our Father, and the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, make us worthy, O Lord, to say thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, that is the kingdom, power, and glory now and forever. In the love of God the Father, grace of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Peace be with you.